So we're going through a two-week series here called Desperate Households, and last Sunday we talked about how anxiety and fear um, are, are, are things that we often find ourselves clinging to, and how we need to instead release our grip from, from those anxieties and fears and instead hold on to the, the rock of Jesus Christ. As a representation of that uh, and, a, and kind of a symbol of that reminder, uh, we provided these rocks uh, for anybody that would like them. Uh, so if you weren't here or if you didn't grab one, or if you know somebody who could benefit from that reminder them, themselves, then please, after the service, come up and, and grab a rock or two or three and uh, have that for you and, and for others. Um, and if you are viewing online and you would like one of these, you can either let us know. We'll make sure that you get one. Or you can uh, text somebody that you know that's here and, and they can grab one for you. Uh, but today, like I said, we're going to continue to talk about this, this uh, uh, issue of desperate households, how many of our households, our families, our marriages, our relationships, our friendships, our communities are in desperation. They're in peril. And today we're going we're gonna to talk about something, a phrase that I'm sure you've heard before, sins of the forefathers, sins of the forefathers. And that, that is a very real thing. It's a very real thing. It's not just a phrase because there are family traits that are often passed down from parents to children. Now, in a very humorous light, you know, to the chagrin of, of my kids, you know, there are certain traits, that personality traits that, that I have that, that are present in, in my kids, and they don't always appreciate that. Sometimes they do. But that this also applies to choices and sins from our lives or generations before us and how they continue in the lives of of uh, people presently and then as we, as we go on generation to generation. You see, we take what has happened to us as kids and we end up doing a lot of the very same things. But God wants us, he wants us to move into a new paradigm. For all of us, we are but one link in a chain of all those who've lived before us and those who will continue after we're gone Lydia, can you give me a hand really quick? Come on up. You really don't have a choice. I, I mean, it's just... All right, so Lydia, why don't you grab this end here. I'm going to have you hold it right here, okay? And then, uh, Josh, you want to help me out? Dad, you're going to grab this other end and take it over there until it's nice and tight. Oh, I'm going to not straddle that. That wouldn't be good. All right. So this right here, keep that tight, is the chain that we find ourselves enmeshed in. And this right here, this link is you. This is you. And as we look at all those that have gone before us, generations, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, aunts, uncles, all those, all those generational people before you, there, for many of us, there are destructive and harmful, hurtful, uh, pain-ridden realities that have existed for generations, for years prior to us, and then, and then, and then there's you. And the decisions you're making today oftentimes can, can be a continuation of that generational legacy of hurt and pain and destruction and then can transcend and continue for generations to come. And so what we're going to talk about today is, is how can we break this chain? How can we identify that there is a, a generational legacy of hurt and pain and destruction and harm that has existed and then instead choose to refuse to allow that to continue, not only in our lives, but for those that come after. So that's what we're going to be addressing today. Thank you so much. Give them a round of applause. That was so good. In 1974, Harry Chapman wrote the song, Cats in the Cradle. We, we've heard this song, we know this song, uh, but just in case, here's a, here's a little refresher. The last verse of the song, 
It goes like this. I've long since retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my job's a hassle, and the kids have the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. Those can be some haunting words for any parent. You see, the, the, the cycle of parents passing down to their children, that's been going on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And some of those things passed down are, are positive. They're good. But there's also been some significant things that have been hurtful and destructive. Familial unhealthy dysfunction and its consequences are passed down from parents to children, from generation to generation. And then we end up finding ourselves forever repeating these same decisions and behaviors and choices. And some of us come from family backgrounds of defeatism, divorce, adultery, Pessimism, selfishness, greed, anger, pride, addiction. And unless we break the chain, unless we break this cycle that just perpetuates from generation to generation, those traits are going to be passed on to our children and to our children's children and to their children. You see, our dysfunctional personal behavior will either become an opposing model or a positive influence for generations to come. So let's look at one of the big timers from the Bible to kind of get an example about how it is that we might get involved in breaking the chain. We're going to look at Abraham. Here's a photograph. Now Abraham, from the Old Testament... He, he came from a pagan, sinful, familial culture. That was his reality. That was the water he swam in. But instead, instead of continuing in that chain of hopelessness, Abraham instead it decided instead to break the chain and to create a different legacy, a legacy of hope, a legacy of renewal, a legacy of, of healing, a legacy that is focused on God and not on self. And because Abraham, because he left the sinfulness of his past generations, God made specific promises to him that then carried on for generations to come. Look at what God says to Abraham. Because of the decision that Abraham made, God says this in Genesis thirteen sixteen. He says to Abraham, I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, the dust, then your offspring could be counted. For Abraham, he was able to see the destruction, the harmfulness of of his past, of the the legacy that had been laid out before him in, in, in in those chain links. And he knew that for his children, for his children's children, and then for generations to come, in order for them to experience hope and life, he had to break the chain that it began with him. There's another really powerful example that comes from one person's commitment to break the chain and to create a new legacy of hope and healing, and that comes from David. We've all heard about David, David and Goliath, that David. And David, he becomes the king of Israel, and he's highly regarded by God himself. 
In Acts 13, it says this about David. How would you like to be described as this? In Acts 13, it says, After removing Saul, God made David their king. And God testified concerning David, saying, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. But we're not going to focus on David. Rather, we're going to fast forward 50 years. 50 years to David's great grandson, Abijah. Abijah. Now, unlike David, Abijah was not faithful to God. It was not, he was not a man after God's own heart. And we see that in, in, in 1 Kings chapter 15 where it says, Abijah committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God and the heart of David his forefather, as, is, as the heart of David his forefather had been. But here's, here's what I want residing deep in your consciousness here this morning. And this illuminates the importance of making the decision today to begin a new legacy of hope and healing for generations to come because even though Abijah did not follow the Lord like his great-grandfather David did, Abijah still received favor. But he only received favor because of David's faithfulness. As evidenced in the next verse, years before Abijah was even born in 1 Kings 15, 4, nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, gave David a lamp in Jerusalem by raising up a son to succeed him and by making Jerusalem strong. And if that wasn't proof enough, let's fast forward even further. Many generations later, we're going to look at King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, who was dying, a descendant of David, and all the while he was being threatened by the nation of Assyria, they were just knocking on Jerusalem's door, ready to overcome. And in 2 Kings chapter 20, the prophet Isaiah, he receives these words from God concerning Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 5 through 6. This is what it says. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. More than 250 years after David had died, because of David's faithfulness to the Lord, because of David's commitment to break the chain and to create a new legacy of hope and healing for generations to come. Because of that, God showed mercy to David's descendants. Now, these are very concrete examples shown in God's word about how powerful it is once one person, one person decides to break the chain but we're going to break it down a little bit more practical. We're going to look at two different families. This was a study that was done in the late 1800s, 1874. And this is a picture of Max Jukes. Max Jukes. Now, in 1874, a a, a member of the uh, New York State uh, Prison Board noticed that six prisoners, six, actually six members of the Jukes family were incarcerated at the same time. And so what they did is they, they looked at the, the lineage of this family and they found that, that the family, as far back as they could see, originated with this guy, Max, Max Jukes. And Max was born in 1720. Now, 
records and, and those that had written about Max and whatnot, um, he was described as things like lazy and godless. He was an alcoholic. He had low moral character, didn't have any moral values, certainly didn't have um, any concern about, about God or, or our faith. Uh, he was described as the town troublemaker. And then he ended up marrying a woman who was very much like him. Same values, same, uh, same uh, uh, absent moral uh, uh, focus. And then they ended up, this couple, Max and his wife, had six daughters and two sons. Now, the research that was being done here in 1874 then uh, showed that the couple had generated 1,200 descendants who were alive by 1874. Of those 1,200 descendants, 310 were homeless, 160 were prostitutes, 180 suffered from drug or alcohol abuse, and 150 were criminals who spent time in prison, including seven for murder. In contrast, there was another family heritage that was compared to the Jukes lineage. Researchers looked at another man living at the same time as Max Jukes, and his name was Jonathan Edwards. You may have heard of Jonathan Edwards. He was the famous Puritan preacher of the time. And Jonathan Edwards was a deeply religious man. He had a moral code, and he focused on giving his best to God, and he married a wife who was, who was determined to do the same. And together, they had 11 children, and they had 1,400 descendants in all. And of those 1,400, 13 were college presidents, 65 were college professors, 100 were attorneys, 32 were state judges, 85 authors of classic books, 66 of them were physicians, 80 of them held political offices, including three state governors, three were state senators, and one of them became the vice president of the United States. That's a striking difference. You see, in some, in some cases, a family sin may go so far back that no one even knows where it originated from. It, it just is part of that family's lineage and culture. And you see, selfish parents often produce selfish children. Alcoholic parents will sometimes and often produce alcoholic children. And, and spousal abusers often have children who grow up and abuse their spouse or are abused by their spouse. Research actually shows that approximately 90% of people in prison in the United States have either had a parent or close family member in jail. But we can be the Abraham or David in our family. We can be the Abraham or David who decides, who decisively decides to break the chain. To recognize that there's a lineage, link by link, that has been built of destructiveness, of harm and pain. And maybe some of us are manifesting that in our lives today, but we can decide to break that chain and have significant lasting impact on the generations that follow us. We can truly embrace what Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, where he says, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. You know, in my own life, for instance, I, I became aware of a generational legacy of pain and hurt and destruction that had been present in my life, link after link after link. Generations of, of, of men and women making choices and decisions towards harm and, and, and pain and destruction, not turning to God, not making him the priority, not giving him what it is that he deserves, and then, then it came to me. 
And this generational legacy of pain and hurt and destructiveness was, was then laid down in my lap, and I had to make a choice. I had to make a choice. A am I going to be a continuation of this? Am I going to just passively continue in this lineage that's been laid out before me, or am I going to commit to today deciding that no, no, I'm going to break this chain. I'm going to break this chain, and I'm going to instead create a legacy towards hope and renewal in life that will have implications for years and years to come. You know, I do marriage counseling with, uh, with a lot of couples and, and premarital counseling, and, and one of the things that I always make sure that I say, especially to a couple as they're preparing uh, for marriage, is, is my job is not to get you ready for the wedding day. That's the wedding coordinator. My job is to get you ready for every day that follows. Every day. It's one of the best advice that I ever got from, uh, from anybody in my life was, was when I was um, talking to a pastor uh, well before I met my wife, and he said, when you get married, every day look at your wife, and without her knowing, verbally say out loud, God, thank you so much for my wife. Especially those days that you don't want to. Every day I do that. I look at my wife and I say, God, thank you so much for my wife. She's never heard me say that, but I do it. That's what a commitment to breaking the chain and, and, and deciding to, to live to establish a new and profound legacy for generations to come. That's what that looks like. It's every day. Every day looking at God and saying, God, thank you so much for who you are and for the chance that I have to give this day to you, to honor you in my decisions and my choices for the sake of the generations that follow. And it's not, just, it's not just our kids or our grandkids or our great-grandkids. It's, it's all those that we inspire and influence along the way. Every single person in here, you are influencing and inspiring people all the time. You're not aware of it. But every interaction you, may, you have in life Every conversation that you engage into, every relationship that is a part of your existence, you have influence. You are inspiring people. You know, I, I have a, 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 a saying that I, I say maybe too much, um, but I, I, just, I, I just love it. It's so, such a good reminder to me. People are like elevators. They either bring you up or they bring you down. I want to be an elevator that brings people up. We need to think generationally. We need to make this moment today the moment where we determine that we're going to break the chain and we're going to, we're going to commit to a legacy, to a lineage of hope and, and healing, of peace and love, the fruits of the Spirit, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, Love, joy, peace, patience, and self-control. We're going to commit to these things today. And then do you know what you do tomorrow? You do that again. Today I'm going to commit to these things. And then the day after that, I'm going to commit to these things. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves every single day because we are fickle, fickle people. Every day Paul says we need to take up our cross. See, you may look at your family tree and not like what you see. Let's plant a new one. Let's plant a new tree. Let's create a new lineage. Let's create a lineage of hope. Let's create a lineage of peace. Let's be where it 
it starts again. It starts new. It starts with us. Abraham drew a line in the sand. He said that all that that had come before me, I'm going to decide today to break the chain. Instead, I'm going to commit to today, to to tomorrow, the day after that, I'm going to commit it to the Lord to live my life to honor him faithfully. And then years, years down the road, along comes David from that same lineage. And David also makes the commitment. He makes that commitment to live his life today for the sake of God and so that others could see God and experience his goodness. David makes that decision, draws that line in the sand, and then in that same lineage comes Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins, who rose from the dead three days later and is living today. And if we believe in him, we will have life everlasting. You see, Abraham's decision to break the chain, Abraham's decision to draw a line in the sand and say, no, today, today, I'm going to create a new lineage for generations to come. That resulted in Jesus Christ. That can be true for us as well. The decision that we make today to carry on a lineage to begin and set forward a lineage that will benefit generations to come, that will bring about Jesus in the lives of people. That's what it's about. And that's what's at stake. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that today for myself, I commit today for myself that today, Lord, I, I want to I want to focus my heart and my mind on you. I want to embrace, to absorb your goodness that you proclaim, and, and I want to commit today to give you everything that I am. And then tomorrow, Lord, I, I, I pray for the, the ability, the focus, Lord, the determination to make that same decision in the days that follow. And I pray that for every single person in this room. That we wouldn't just passively go through life as a result of all the hurt and pain and damage, destruction that has been a part of our past lineage, that we will decide today to break the chain to commit to a new lineage of hope and healing that results in your son, Jesus Christ, being revealed to a world that so desperately needs him. Lord, lead us in the way everlasting, I pray in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today, guys. Thank you so much for joining in virtually. Hope you have a wonderful day. God bless you.